So there's a really interesting uh, uh, episode coming up. A lot of people sometimes are wondering, like, how can you ex expect Torah, which is a really old book that is considered, you know, like, really religious and, uh, and ancient. And how can you connect it to the new findings? Well, you'd be surprised. There's really interesting things. Uh, you just have to, you know, like, listen and hear and, and be open-minded. Um, here, basically, ChatGPT brought up a few interesting topics. I didn't bring them up specifically in the, in the episode. You'll see. Um, but this is just, you know, I was curious. It says here, for example, the concept of days in creation story of the Torah and how it relates to the scientific understanding of the age of the universe and the process of evolution. <laughs> we know that evolution is, you know, the theory of evolution has not been around for many, many years. Like Darwin talked about it something like uh, 120, 150 years ago, something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. But... Um, there's also like views, different views of how we view, uh, for example, in the concept of days, I talk about it with uh, Mori Michael, days being maybe more than days or whatever. Some some people say it is days, but it's not that the universe didn't exist before the Torah, it did, but but with different, uh, but like pre-civilization, these kinds of uh, ideas. All right, and the second one, it said here, the, the idea of free will in both religious and scientific context, including the debates over the determinism and uh, chaos theory. Uh, determinism. I always hear this word, determinism, although I think I knew it once, but like I want to just refresh my mind. Some people might be shocked I don't know this. It's a philosophical view. I do know that where all events are determined completely by previously existing causes. It's like a cause and effect, and like this is how... So this event is caused because of determinism. For example, an, an example would be a determinist might argue that a person's gene make him or her anxious. Ah, okay. So it's almost like a pre-existing laws or rules, either by chance or not, that makes a specific behavior or a specific change in the universe. Is, is that what I understand? And how that is connected to the Torah. So I, th I see how determinism is connected to Torah. In interesting. The third um, uh, point here, it says, the ethical implications of scientific discoveries, such as genetics, engineering, and how they relate to Torah teachings on the sanctity of life. You know, uh, when it says here sanct sanctity, um, Human life is sacred, so it's yeah. You have to kind of like wonder. So there's genetic engineering, and there's like the ethical things about it. Like, if is it ethical to genetically engineer, for example, pigs to use their uh, body parts to, to to implant in humans? There's things that are happening right now that are like that. Um, believe it or not, there's also this interesting uh, experiment called CRISPR. That's also interesting. Check it out. So yeah, all those, uh, I'm not going to go through each one of those, but you can check it out here. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of, um, I think, interesting things that I want to learn about before I write the, the, the book or during my writing of the book. Usually um, what comes to mind for me is that I want to do a kind of what happens th throughout the year. Uh, when, you let, when you look for Samaritan festivals... What happens throughout the year also including Shabbat. This is like the outline of the book. So if you look here. So like there are certain parts of the day of the year where the shofar is born, uh, uh, blown. There's um, obviously we have the Passover ceremony and all those things. But what signifies, for example, the, the beginning of the year. I, I think if you ask any Samaritan, it would he would tell you that it's the first prayer of the first uh, of, of the basically the first month of the of the new year. So that's uh, almost like a three hour long prayer. Beautiful poems, beautiful chants. Also, that's how like the, the really the year starts. And after that, we start counting fourteen days until the Passover ceremony can see here there's the photo of the Passover ceremony basically um, you see the holes tourist around 
and uh, you can see the Samaritans here wearing white and bleachers around here because of like and also like chairs for people to come and watch around the world. I've been asked recently if uh, people are come are allowed to come and watch or, or participate. Well, they are allowed to come and watch. Participate is a different thing, I think, because uh, basically only Samaritans are allowed to actually eat from the 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 cooked meat. So, fortunately. Um, but that's like the following the Torah for thousands of generations. This has never changed as we believe. And you know, after the Passover, actually before the Passover, it's worth mentioning we have the unleavened bread. So unleavened bread, Samaritans. Never mind the typos here, uh, but there it is. It's actually a really, really small one. If, if you see, wow, it's really small. I've never seen um, an unleavened bread this small, but up, oh, okay, now I understand. This is not a Samaritan weed one. Okay, like for example, this I would guess this is in the museum. <coughs> this one is interesting because I I've, I've worked in the museum and uh, the the piece stays in, stayed in the museum for like usually it stays for even like a year or two years. It wouldn't rot because there's no yeast in it, um, and it, you you wouldn't know if it's rotten or not or if it's crispy or not you wouldn't know it's a huge lava but why am i mentioning this because this for example this photo here this is one of my favorite times of the year um usually this is the the day before the passover ceremony and the people here they gather they bring the you know the those special ovens to uh prepare the uh, bread and also the smell of the bread would be everywhere it's amazing. Uh, it's like a, uh, signifying the coming of the festivals. So only after that day we start preparing the Passover ceremony, uh, for the Passover ceremony, which starts at sunset and ends at midnight. Actually, it even ends at sunrise, if you think about it, because we have to burn all the leftovers of the lamps. <coughs> so yeah, I imagine the book to be like this, basically from my perspective, being... You know, talking about those prayers, but also there's a, a certain like uh, view that I want to take the reader to, view or perspective or whatever you want to call it. And I say that because whenever I do a tour uh, on Mount Gerizim, I feel that the the tourist is going through like I don't know. It's almost like watching a movie. I see them on their eyes. Uh, I see that on their eyes. And, um, you know, that's something special. So maybe the book can help me, you know, even like add another dimension to that. So if we look here, this is one of the most famous photos you'll ever see on the internet. It's usually the priest standing on this rock that he, that everyone knows this is for the priest to stand on. Interestingly, some people discovered, uh, some archaeologists discovered some kind of gold and silver under that, believe it or not. And, um... We don't, I don't. I'm not familiar with what with what with, with what was that, but there's many archaeology going on. So yeah, uh, after the Passover ceremony finishes, we have seven days of eating unleavened bread, and then we have the uh, Shavuot. I, I'm wondering, like, if you put Shavuot on Google. Ooh, very bad typo. Sorry for that. Shavuot should be like this, A-U-O-T. Uh, did I say Google? I wanted to say Samaritan's uh, prayer. You would say these. So obviously we have a Shavuot uh, pilgrimage because uh, we have like the same festivals as the uh, Jewish people. We they have, uh, I mean, not the same. We only don't have Purim and Hanukkah again, but we do have uh, like the, the concept of Aliyah Baregel, which means going up. Uh, on foot, which is what we do. This is the synagogue that the prayer starts in. Wow, that's a really old photo, though. You can tell from the carpets. That's a lot. Of, like for me, it's really nostalgic. And um, and we have uh, you know again the basically at three a.m. people come here, they gather, they read until four a.m. People start gathering outside the synagogue to prepare to go to the top of the mountain and prepare the and practice the pilgrimage which consists of different um, prayers and readings and yeah 
the cantor basically raising the Torah as you see here. Why are the why are those moments so special? I think they preserved something unique in in the human culture. You know, um, we're, I'm not saying the Samaritans are the only ones who who did this. But once you go and once you watch a maybe a Samaritan prayer or a Samaritan pilgrimage, what you'll notice is that there is a, a certain kind of like there is a certain kind of like peace about it. Obviously, no one is using their um, uh, phones or anything like that, so so there is a certain like peace about it, and then you feel like you really went back in time. That's how I feel sometimes. Not in the sense that. I'm back to the old ways and ancient ways. It just feels, I don't know, like it feels like you're living through history, if that makes sense. Hey, Larry, hope you're having a wonderful day. All right. So, one thing I, oh, I, I think, um, I have an idea also for a video of going to one of the Samaritan scribes, um, filming him like, well, we, I say one of the Samaritan scribes, but we only have one, I'm, I'm literally aware of two or three <coughs> that um, basically know, like t teach us how to uh, write uh, some ancient Hebrew in hand, because again, the computers today are, are doing all the job, we talk about AI uh, taking over. Uh, <coughs> excuse me yeah and the idea is that I think yeah I love ancient Hebrew I love the way that ancient Hebrew is written so I think there's something really special about it the uh, letters in when you look at the Samaritan Hebrew they resemble really interesting things so like for example you can imagine that it's obvious that you know the early humans would use signs to communicate between each other and then from signs it also started being from signs drawn it also started being from signs as sent as sounds so for example the letter like uh, tough is a ta and this vibration of, of the of the mouse the ta or even the rish ra started to basically become a tool to communicate that's something that we take for granted in language right and then we found ways to even make it to, to communicate faster by attaching those letters um so that's why i'm i'm, I'm super uh, passionate about it yeah larry I'm, I'm glad you see it it's definitely special the, all the you know the the clothing and 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 the torah being held and uh, like my favorite times would be also when we have the shofar or when we have the incense being like you know viewed from left and right like uh, shook from left and right and the smoke going out of it all that thing is for me it's it's fascinating it's it, it's beautiful it's holy so i always always love to uh see those let's see i think it samaritans notes I think it's here. It's, sorry, I'm just looking for this file, and I even forgot the name of the book. But if I if I recall correctly, it was in this one one of these folders. But suddenly I stopped finding it. It's a PDF file, basically. Uh, what was the name of the website that you can find PDF files? Was it PDF files <laughs> online? Something like that, I believe. Uh, I love PDF. Maybe. Oh no, I don't think. No, that's actually a converting one. Free PDF convert. Um, free. Do tell me if you know, guys. Free download um, PDF live, something like that. I think it's PDF Drive, right? Let me share with, with the screen with you. So it should be this one, PDF 
Oh, uh, wait, PDF uh, drive. Just pressed on it. There we go. I think so. Yeah. We search for Samaritan um, history. You should get something. How, um, you know, how incredible it's, it's yesterday I gave a uh, kind of like a small lecture to uh, a few students in uh, the US. I forgot the name of the state and the university. It was a 40 minute lecture, but it's so interesting because they found, they basically keep this really old scroll. They showed me it. And also they showed me this um, a tablet that has ancient Hebrew on it. That was incredible. And they said that they are, like, I talked to the person who's watching over it. So, oh, never mind, uh, Larry. I just wanted to find this website, so it's okay. Uh, let's see here. Bad Samaritans. That's definitely not connected to Samaritans. But here, I think this is this is the one we're talking about. Shalom. I do not drink Coca Cola anymore. That's really good. You're not drinking Coca Cola anymore. Even the diet one is not that good for you, right? Although I do like maybe like cheat money maybe once every few months. I like to. I don't know. Sometimes you find yourself in those. Uh, situations <laughs> all right so this is one interesting book that i always see it's like the it's american pentateuch an introduction to its origin history <coughs> sorry and significance is it downloading oh there we go that's the whole book that's amazing um so a uh, beautiful cover here by the way this writing I'm definitely familiar with. That's not the first time I've seen this writing. Let's see. I, I want to jump to a random page here and just read a few things and see what it, what it talks about. That's really interesting. Because here, that's a lot of pages. So, <coughs> here's something I sometimes don't understand. What is canon? It's almost like... I, what I understand canon means, it's, it's like a, is it a collection of papers or is it Torah? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's connected to, to something like this. Um, let's chat, let's ask ChatGPT here. What does canon mean? And I'm, I know the other meaning of the word canon, but what does canon uh, mean when we are talking about scrolls? In context of scrolls, the term canon generally refers to the collection of texts. Oh, yeah, there we go. That are considered author author authoritative and accepted as scripture with a particular religious tradition. These texts are usually considered to be divinely inspired or in some way sacred and are held in high esteem by adherents of the religion. And says so in the and then it gives an example of Judaism. And so yeah, that's what I had in mind just to confirm that. Anyways, coming back to the PDF. So it says here, one of the fascinating and at times frustrating aspects of the evidence for the origin and early history of the Samaritan Pentateuch is the compo compositional, let's make this a little bit bigger, variety among the Qumran manuscripts. This variety has given rise to debate over appropriate nomenclature. Not sure what that is. Let's see. the devising or choosing of the names for things okay the scrolls from Qumran are variously labeled biblical rewritten Bible parabiblical and commentary all such labels reflect answers to common questions how much can multiple versions of a text vary and still be considered the same composition how much variable is allowed before Bible becomes rewritten Bible or parabible kind of saying in, in other words um, can you call this Torah if it has those parts uh, changed in it, right? So this is what it's talking about. Interesting. Okay, it says here also, if we look, I was, I was, how much 
can multiple versions of a text vary? We talked about this. There we go. So can two renditions both be biblical? The textual tradition that would eventually become the Masoretic text is only one tradition evidenced at Qumran and the line between uh, canonical constraint and exegetical ingenuity. What is exegetical? What is that? That sounds cool. What is... Do let me know if if it, if the chat GPT gets it wrong, guys. By the way, all right. It says here exegetical ingenuity refers to the skill and creativity with which a person interprets and analyzes and analyzes religious text, often with the aim of uncovering deeper and more nuanced meanings that may be immediately apparent. The term exege exegesis refers to the process of critical interpretations and analysis of religious text and ingenuity refers to the ability to think creatively and yeah well that i know can be seen as a variety it says here exegetical ingenuity can be seen as a variety of contexts from academic scholarship to personal spiritual practice it often involves close reading of text attention to historical and cultural context and a willingness to engage with the complexities and contradictions within the text, it may also involve drawing on insights from other disciples, such as philosophy or literally criticism, to shed light on text. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me if I stop even for a one one word or two words, guys. I I really don't want to pass sometimes on words that I don't understand because, you know, I'm in this research process and I'm still, honestly, I haven't read many. I mean, books like this. So these, some of those meanings come first time to me. Like, I I, I like what this means. Wow. Fascinating. Uh, exegesis? Okay. What, what, what is this one? I'll search for it, Larry. Let's see. What happens if I search the... So it says here, critical explanation of interpretation of a text. So it's like criticizing this was, uh, how a text is interpreted. Kind of like what many people say, like, ask me how do you interpret this or that. An example would be, this reading of Revelation is an example of Exodus. It looks like the original historical context. It looks how this passage fits into the rest of the messages. Okay. It's basically like um, seeing how this passage fits with this specific tradition or this con original context. You see? Cool. <coughs> All right, it says here, exegesis provides a, strat a strategy for religious renewal. Renewal and innovation are almost always covert rather than explicit in ancient Israel. <clears throat> I know that there is explicit and implicit, but what is covert? Is that implicit? Let's see what ChatGPT says here. What is meant with covered in this sentence? The word covered means hidden or implicit. Oh, there we go. So explicit and implicit, like like what I thought. Okay. <clears throat> it says here also number three, in many cases, exegesis involves not the passive implica explication but the radical supervision of prior authoritative text these phenomena are found in literature of ancient israel before the closure of the canon <clears throat> all right i want to go to the table of contents choose uh, something else let's see here it says stories of samaritan origins textual oh this is really interesting Samar stories of samaritan origins see here it, ga it gave they gave it like 20 um, pages. Let's hop to that. Let's see what's up. I, you know, I think I did read a few pages from this book before. I have some memories about it for some reason. So here it says the Samaritans canonized only the Pentateuch, the first five books of what most Jews and Christians accept from the he uh, from Hebrew tradition. These books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, known to both Samaritans and Jews by the first Hebrew word of each book, are second only to God in the basic affirmations of the Samaritan Creed. The words of these books defined the location of the Samaritan holy place and the services performed there, and established the qualifications for the priesthood and its hierarchy. The task of, the, of their interpretation is the major source of priestly status. The Samaritan Pentateuch is re read and revered in all services of Samaritan worship. Pretty correct. 
Eight words are craved in stone to decorate and protect synagogues. Hmm. I see why decorate, but protect. Maybe protect, like maybe bless or something. That's what they mean. And are carefully copied by hand on parchment or quality paper to be passed down from one generation to the next. Usually we can hand, yeah, you can say that. The Samaritan Pentateuch has been in meaningful, sometimes accidental and sometimes deliberate dialogue with the uh, Masoretic text and the LXX text of the Pentateuch. The reintroduction of the Samaritan Pentateuch to Europe in the 17th century immediately placed the Samaritan Pentateuch in the midst of a religious controversy that would last nearly 200 years. That's a lot, right? Because just 200 years ago, people, especially from the West, discovered most of the time that there is actually something called Samaritan Pentateuch which was probably mind-blowing to them, right? Like, wow, so these are Samaritans and they have another... Like, imagine the shock that some people were in when they discovered there's a new, like, another kind of, like, version of the of the Pentateuch. I, I don't know more than the LXX, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the uh, Masoretic Text. If you're aware of any other fourth or fifth edition, let us know, guys. That would be interesting. The plan of this book, it talks about the chapters, so still we're not at the origins. Okay, sorry. <laughs> thought I was talking about the origins. Here it says the Samaritan story. Let's see what it says here about the Samaritan story. All right. It says here, the Samaritan version of the community's origin and of the origin of the SP is recorded in several chronicles produced by the community and with some modifications recounted by K. Linky. That's what, how it's pronounced. According to the Samaritan version, the Samaritan community represents the pure Israel, from which other f factions later broke off. <coughs> in like fashion, the Mosaic Torah preserved by the Samaritans is considered the genuine version, while the text favored the majority of Judaism is viewed as a product of Hirsi of Eli, Samuel's mentor and guardian promoted by the false cult centered in Jerusalem and later extended Further, by the deceptive work of Ezra, the story can be found in Kitab At-Tarikh. Kitab At-Tarikh means basically the book of history. A Samaritan wrote this, Abu Fatah, I think. And um, just curious if if, if, if ChatGPT ever uh, crossed, it had this on its uh, database. Do you know about this book? No, it says here it's an Islamic book and seems to be really con um, yeah, uh, confident, so never mind that. I'm not surprised. Continuing, <clears throat> so we have an excerpt here from this uh, part. It says here, now he, Eli, had two sons, Hofni and Pinchas, who rounded up young women of attractive appearance and brought them into the tabernacle that had been built up by their father. They let them savor the food of the sacrifices and had intercourse with them inside the tabernacle. At the same time, the children of Israel became three factions, a loyal faction on Mount Gerizim, a heretical uh, faction that followed false gods, and the faction that followed Eli, son of Yahini, in Shiloh. So that's the, same, the, that's the usual story that the Eli took uh, the tabernacle to be the concept of the, ta of the tabernacle to be built in Shiloh instead of Mount Gerizim. Ketef Hinnom scrolls, or aka silver scrolls, an amulet from the first temple period containing the priestly blessings. Oh, thank you for sharing that biblical DNA. Wow, that's a lot. Like That's pretty uh, ancient. Makes it 2,000 years. <clears throat> Continuing on, it says here the Samaritan Chronicle two is aware of Hashomronim, Samaritan's label, and explains its applications to the Samaritans. And it says here, in the days of Omri, a man of the community of the Samaritan Israel, Israelites of the tribe of Ephraim and the, and the son of Joseph, went and bought Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he fortified the city and called its name after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill of Samaria. It had previously been a fortress belonging to the community of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Yeroboam is considered to be, um, you have Yeroboam and you have Rehoboam, right? Yeroboam was, wasn't he a Samaritan or like, is he considered Northern Israelites? 
if anyone listening knowing he knows here, can you please explain who was Jeroboam? We know that Rehoboam was the son of King Solomon. Jeroboam was, wasn't he a high priest, a Samaritan high priest? Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. All right. Now this nobleman went and bought it and afterwards he began rebuilding it. So he and his people, the descendants of Ephraim, the son of Joseph, inhabited and all the cities uh, which lay round about it. They called its name the name of the cities which lay round about it, Har Shamron. Ah, the Israelites who dwell in these cities were named Shamronim after the name Shamron and its cities. There you go. If you were wondering where does the word Shamronim comes from, this is one interpretation we have. The oldest surviving texts currently known from the Hebrew Bible. That's really interesting. And are they written in um, Assyrian Hebrew, Biblical DNA? Appreciate you if you're telling me that. Or is it ancient Hebrew? Because I don't think if it's the first temple, I don't think it's Hebrew, Ashurit. Anyways, it says here, to a Yahweh cult centered in Shechem. Wait, what is that? Oh, we skipped here, I believe. Okay, it says here, <clears throat> while he does not appeal to events concerning Elior Shemer, talking about a person called Etine Nodet, he represents apparently a, seg a segment of historical critical scholarship. All right, Nodet does suggest that the community has its roots in the distant past among northerners who were not exiled by the Babylonians and who con constitute the original Israelites. He concludes... If anything, the returnees, those coming from Babylon, represented by Ezra and Nehemiah, created the split or the separation by not cooperating with the people of the land. The former developed into the Jews of Jerusalem, and the elements of the latter eventually became the Jews of Samaria, better known as the Samaritans. Note it finds the early Samaritans related to Yahweh cult centered in Shechem, at times referred to as Bethel, strongly tried to Jacob and Aaron traditions and eventually, but no later than mid fourth century, transferred to nearby Gerizim. So that's one interpretation. Mid fourth century BCE. There's definitely arguments in like archaeological diggings recently found been found that points to Samaritans being on Mount Gerizim a little bit kind of much older than that. But then a person would argue, were they really Samaritans? Yerbarim is a form of the house of Ephraim. Is from the house of Ephraim. All right, thank you for sharing that biblical DNA. The first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Oh, he was the first king. Okay. You see, this is one question I get asked, and I want to also research more. Who were the kings in the north? Because there's always a talk of the southern kings. It's it was in Paleo Hebrew characters. All right, the Ketifahinom. Thank you, biblical DNA. I think I. I had a guess on that. Yeah, it makes sense if it's that old. <coughs> Sorry. All right. <coughs> this is really interesting what I'm reading, by the way. Um, all right. Noted claims support for his reconstruction from a Qumran fragment of Deuteronomy published by James Charles Whitworth. The fragment dated to the late Hasmonean period identifies Mount Gerizim as the site on which to build an altar. So it obviously looks like a Samaritan Pentateuch or a Samaritan fragment. And again, uh, pay attention. This It says, uh, it talks about Qumran here. And it says here, most likely, wait, wait, we were here. The tradition represented in the Masoretic text, which locates, oh, so consequently, so you have the original and the non-original, or like the, here it's comparing the Masoretic text with the um, uh, Samaritan one. A. Maskil Hayabud, how much research have you done into Levantine and Israelite Jewish Samaritan population genetic studies? A uh, good question. I actually, um, I haven't dug deep into the genetic uh, studies, but um, I did a DNA test myself. Really interesting results. I'll share soon. Um, I can tell you, like, we have a really high percentage. So apparently, like, the Cohen family has an incredibly high percentage of Levantine. So, like over ninety-seven percent, if you want to know the exact number, but 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 yeah, I will definitely make new episodes, uh, future episodes on that. If you have anything to share with us, please feel free. 
that fragments has been proven a fake. Oh, Larry. Okay, interesting. Similarly, Nodit maintains that the laws of Moses minus the weekly Shabbat commandment first appeared in Samaria at Shechem in conjunction with Gerizim and its priesthood and was committed to, rewrite, uh, to writing sometimes between 250 and 200 BCE. Interaction with the returning Babylonian exiles resulted in some shared customs such as the weekly Shabbat and considerable literary, literary activity between the Shechemites and the Jerusalemites including a shared Pentateuch. So at some point, obviously, they had a shared Pentateuch, one Pentateuch. Obviously, because the split, uh, also the the difference happened like later, so it makes sense. All right, it says here, inevitably, tensions arose between the two groups over the Jerusalemites' insistence that they and they alone were heirs of all Israel. These tensions were express, expressed in competing claims to a legitimate priesthood and gradual marginalization of the Shechemites conquer, concurrent with the uh, ascend, ascendancy so I think like ascending or like basically the root of the it's coming from ascending I guess okay but what's how can you interpret that exactly Thank you for sharing that biblical DNA. I'm getting better, by the way, if you're asking about the cough. All right, it says here, ascendancy refers to a position or dominance, dominance uh, or influence over others, often achieved through, uh, achieved through gradual and persistent efforts. It can be used to describe a person, group, or idea that has gained power or influence over others and is often associated with a sense of superiority or control. Okay. That's enough to know. I'm in a group of Jews mostly centered around discord and anthrogenica that discusses our researches this stuff and researches this stuff. You mean that's interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, I see what you mean. Iron Age Israelites, though. I don't know about the Iron Age and when was it connected to Samaritans, but that sounds interesting. That's really old, right? So. All right, it says here, it has co become common for interested readers to turn to 2KGS 17 for an account of Samaritan origins, so to Kings 17. The version of the story traces the community back to forced immigrants from Mesopotamia who eventually adopted a, heret a heretical form of Yahwism. Many English translations identified as Samaritans as the subject of the story in verse 20 29, and it is not uncommon to find this identification reinforced in textbooks for Old Testament survey courses. Hmm. So close inspection, however, reveals that Shomronim of 2GKJS are not the Samaritans at all, but rather the people of Samaria, who relationship to, whose relationship to the Samaritan religious uh, group is not clear. In fact, Fledman notes, even in Josephus, we cannot always be sure that the word translated Samaritans may not refer to Samaritans, that is, the inhabitants, not necessarily Samaritans of Samaria. So, so yeah, so when we talk about Samaria, sometimes Shomrim, Shomronim, uh, apparently here it says that some people might think that these are actually the Samaritans, but no, it could just mean people who are living in Shomron. Therefore, they were called Samaritans, much like Canaanites being called Canaanites because they lived in Canaan, like the same, I think, idea. So, I was dealing with terrible allergies years ago. We already have producing. I don't think it's an allergy biblical DNA. For me, it's more like a, just like a, I went outside after a hot a hot shower, so that probably was the reason. Okay, and here it says, let's see. Having posited a connection between the Kuthins, so Kuthins is from Kutha, which is near Iraq, and the Samaritans, Josephus describes in a somewhat inconsistent manner conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, who are evil and env env enviously disposed to the Jews during the times of Darius <clears throat> and reformation of the schism during the reign of Anti Anti Antiochus. <coughs> Let's see who was he uh, real quick. Who was <clears throat> without the F over there? 
Portland to UCF. All right, he was a Greek king of the Seleucid Empire who ruled 175 to 164 BCE. He is best known. <clears throat> Excuse me. He is best known for his attempts to suppress Judaism in the land under his control, which led to the Maccabe Maccabean revolt and establishment of the Hasmonean dynasty in Judea. Wow, okay. Um, that's something like 2,000 years ago. He came to power after the death of his brothers. He immediately faced challenges from rival uh, claimants to the thorn the throne as well as ongoing conflicts with neighbors powers as Egypt and Rome in order to consolidate his power and secure his position and to go implement a series of reforms let's see let's ask it how how did he affect the Samaritans do you think it would say something <clears throat> his policies towards the Samaritans are somewhat controversial and open to interpretation and as there are relatively few sources that provide a detailed account of his interactions with this group. Remember to take this with lightly. I'm not sure if this is correct. According to some historical sources, he his policies towards the Samaritans were generally favorable. The Samaritans, who were a distinct religious and ethnic group, uh, had often faced discrimination and prosecution under previous rulers, particularly the Jewish Hasmonean dynasty. And Antiochus is said to have rec recognized the Samaritans as a distinct group with their own customs and beliefs and have granted a degree of autonomy within the Selu Seleucid Empire. Apparently he was kind of okay with the Samaritans. <coughs> Maybe. In case, in any case, it is clear that the Samaritans played a relatively minor role in the larger political and religious conflict that characterized... Okay, going back. If you want to read this, that's here. Here's an excerpt from this book. I only have AJ12257. I believe this is like either a chapter or a number of a page. It says here, When the Samaritans saw the Jews under these sufferings, they no longer confessed they were of their kindred, nor that the temple on Mount Gerizim belonged to Almighty God, and they now said that they were a colony of Medes and Persians, and indeed there were a colony of theirs. Interesting. I don't know how did he, where did he come from this one, but Josephus also acknowledges the existence of a Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim, placing its construction in the Hellenistic period. Interesting that he mentions, or they mention temple here. Uh, not surprisingly, Josephus does not include the Samaritans in his various listings of the Jewish sects, thus indicating that he viewed the Samaritans as a separate nation and not as a branch of Judaism. It's really interesting. Okay. Because most people would probably, I mean, not most, so, but definitely many, many people would say it's a branch of Judaism. Samaritans, branch of Judaism. But, like, the way I see it, the way many people see it, Judaism and Samaritanism, it, you know, they are a branch of the Israelites. So. <coughs> All right. Um, going to a, like a little bit after here. So here it says significantly, he says members of both communities can conceivably achieve complete un unanimity. Uh, on the principles of one God, one people, and one sanctuary, but still encounters deep division about where such unity was supposed to be centered. And he, uh, so here, I think they're, they're talking about because here I saw the uh, Samaritan woman connected. Uh, Samaritan woman connected, but is that related to Jesus? She, the Samaritan woman, might discuss the divisions caused by the existence of different worship centers. Uh, on Mount Gerizim in Jerusalem. On this issue, the two could agree in this respect. The 4th century was not so different. 4th century BC was not so different from the 1st century CE, but the Chronicle would probably dispute the assertions made by the narrator, narrator of John. So again, it's in the book of John, so you'd say it's expected that they, they're talking about 
uh, the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman uh, in the book of John. Here we have a conclusion. Progressively detailed excavations on Mount Gerizim, better understandings of Second Temple period relationships between, between Samaria and Judea, and examinations of the materials recovered at Qumran have all shed new light on the development of the SP and, in turn, on the origins of the Samaritan religious sect. Significant doubt is now cast on the former consensus view that Samaritans and Jews split in the 5th century BCE. It's interesting that they use the word split because... Some people would say Samaritans came from outside. It's not really a split. With the pre-2nd century BCE dates from the formation of the Samaritan Pentateuch. So they have the date of the formation of the Samaritan Pentateuch saying that it is in second pre-2nd century BCE. Uh, if Basically putting it as, what, 2,000 years old? Something like that. That's I mean, that's their conclusion here. I think. Uh, but that's again, which conclusion is that? Are those the writers, I think? Probably said the writers. Gradually, from this renewed conversation, two general conclusions are emerging. First, most scholars accept that there was no split between the Samaritans and the Jews in the 5th century BCE. In fact, the split between the two groups was gradual, uneven, and prolonged. And second, it appears likely that the Samaritan Pentateuch with, with the specific sectarian readings characteristic of the text today emerged sometimes between the late century BCE and the earliest century CE. Okay, if the standardization of the proto-MT Masoretic text began in the second half of the first century BCE, and if the first Jewish revolt calculated the emergence of the prototype of interested why interesting why he just uh, mentioned the first Jewish revolt with the emergence of the proto MT does anyone know why why did he connect the Masoretic text with the Jewish revolt maybe he talks about it here thank you so much Amir good to have you my man <coughs> sorry Perhaps the same sequence of events had an equally formative influence on the sex sectarian editing of the SP. That sectarian editing will bear the hallmarks of central and distinctive Samaritan beliefs and insistence that Mount Gerizim is the divinely chosen place for worship, prominence given to Moses as the standard and measure for all pre presumptive prophets to follow. So here this is something common you might see said um, about the Samaritan Pentateuch being that it was... Um, deliberately kind of like uh, edited in small ways to make Mount Gerizim more obviously to be the chosen place. And there and here we have like different interpretation, interpretations. Some people say that that's really doesn't matter that much, that people should, uh, that, that those Samaritans or like those, the, the Samaritans at that time, they edited the, the, these parts because they saw that many people are going away from Mount Gerizim to either other religions or to or to, to Jerusalem even for example say so they had to find a way to kind of like tell people like hello originally this is the mountain and here we have a reminder that the interpretation some people they, they interpreted the word um, some people say that the word will choose saying about Mount Gerizim was actually the original text will choose will choose being actually still Mount Gerizim even though it's will choose so the, the the change happened that it would become chose. Uh, just to confirm, again, we're talking about Mount Gerizim that was chosen. So again, that's one interpretation. Interesting to know. Is it wrong the split happened during this? It is wrong. The split happened during the time of Ezra. Yeah, I, I see what you mean, Larry. I mean, here it says like a, a different date. Um, and... It, they have apparently confidently say it's uh, a split that happened something like uh, a split that happened basically where s scholars agree mostly on when so okay the second one talks about the textual pluriformity in the late second temple period All right, it says here the Samaritan Pentateuch is a connected text. The SP is connected to a religious community from who, for whom it is life and vit vitality. Beautiful. The SP is connected to the broader biblical tradition, providing a unique witness to that tradition. And the SP is connected to a second temple liter literary 
uh, Melu, apart from which our understanding of the biblical traditions itself can only be partial and incomplete. In this chapter, we will consider important editor editorial practices and literary characteristics that helped shape the various biblical versions and traditions. In chapter 3, we'll examine specific Qumran texts that have immediate bearing on the SP and its development. This is really interesting. It's like how Qumran scrolls are connected to the Samaritan Pentateuch. All right, it says here, all right, let's go a little bit further. One of the fascinating and at times frustrating, oh, didn't we read this? <laughs> we did so yeah let's go back a little bit because this gets even more interesting when it finds even more connections between uh, Qumran scrolls and um, Samaritan scrolls all right let's see here proto masoretic text the proto masoretic text labeled proto rabbinic by Frank Moore cross this display the uh, consonantal consonant Tal <laughs> consonant. All right, let's try again. Consonantal, consonantal. All right. First time I ever hear this word. Honestly, what does mean? Again, correct ChatGPT guys. If it, if you if you know the answer here, what does consonantal mean? Uh, something that is related to or composed of consonants. In linguistics, conson consonants are a type of speech sound produced by obstructing or partially obstructing the airflow from the lungs. They are distinguished from vowels, which are produced by allowing the airflow to pass through the vocal tract without obstruction. <clears throat> Does anyone know any example? Can you give an example? This is interesting because now we're talking about like maybe the differences of how uh, Hebrew or ancient Hebrew is actually uh, red, right? That's where I think it's headed. Um, Arabic script. Like the ancient Hebrew script, the Arabic script originally had no separate symbols for vowels or sound and instead relied on various di diacritical marks to indicate vowel sounds. Oh, okay. And there we go. Now I understand. So like for example this word here kitab you have the because you have two dots here that will make it basically a ta if the dots were under it would make it a ba so <clears throat> that's the consonantal for you guys if if I hope remember that one's important okay 1,000 years or more before the time of the Masora Codices, Tov includes 57 Qumran texts in this group, of which 24 are biblical texts, making it the larger, the largest grouping of biblical texts at Qumran. All right, I want to try another book because we're almost out of time. Definitely going to come back to this one. Wow, what a beautiful uh, collection of like interesting uh, you know ideas and stories and researches and references so many references here if you if you notice you can download the Israelite version uh, Samaritan version of the Torah by the way this is pdfdrive.com if you want to check it out Need to download that one to check it out. Let's download it. All right, a random page. Let's see what we get. <clears throat> All right, I think it's a difference. <coughs> Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife or his servant. Wabdu. <laughs> Okay, I see where this is going. Here, in the Samaritan one, we have La Tehmad Betrecha, do not envy or do not covet your neighbor's house, do not covet your neighbor's wife or his servant. In the Samaritan one, there's an in, there's an in extra like word, and it says here, wife or his servant, and also it mentions land. So, 
Ah, there we go. So it says here, uh, his field, right? But interestingly here, this is in Masoretic. Okay, so that's apparently in Exodus 2013, this is mentioned, but in Exodus 15, in Deuteronomy 5.17, you have that field, the, the word field, which is the Sadeh. Interesting. What does it say about this? SP Exodus and SP Deuteronomy present the same reading. Both are at variance with empty Deuteronomy, changing changing the order of house and wife and inserting uh, the aura, then to name the offense against the neighbor's house and property to follow. As, so it says here the empty Deuteronomy versions itemizes the neighbor's field as one of the things that should not should not be coveted both samaritan redemptions renditions mentioned the neighbor's field as well so find that like so the the first one again here and here you have one in exodus what is in deuteronomy same sentences almost but one word missing here this is in the masoretic text the jewish uh, version of the torah they are diff they're different, kind of like one word is missing between the two. However, if you go here to the Samaritan Pentateuch, apparently it ha they have the same. Why? I don't think it talks about why here, but let's see. The Samaritan scribe felt free to follow. Okay, so here I think it's trying to uh, set an explanation, perhaps. It says here the empty Deuteronomy version itemizes the neighbor's field as one of the things that should not be coveted. Both Samaritan tradition, uh, renditions mentioned the neighbor's field as well. Apparently, the Samaritan scribe felt free to follow the read reading presented in either empty Deuteronomy or empty Exodus as the need demanded. The inclusion of field is also found, which does not insert as empty. does not insert the word. I think it should mention shade'u, not tate'u. What is this one? A scroll dated to the early Herodian period, perhaps suggesting a first century BCE or first century date for Samaritan recension and of the Decalogue. Decalogue, if you remember from the last live, apparently means the Ten Commandments. Cool. All right. See if you did it. Download the second one. There we go. This is the Samaritan Pentateuch, um, Israelite Samaritan Pentateuch. You can find it again PDF drive if you want to look. For that, all right. So we're gonna go do this. I like from live to live. I think I want to try to do this sometimes, which is scroll randomly throughout the Torah, and then see where where we stop. This is one kind of like way of when you have this important event coming. Or, for example, when you have, um, like, uh, you can call it uh, either, uh, like, an operation, like, a, God forbid, like, on your body, or if you have a test or anything, you would go to one of the priests and you would ask him to, we call it, to open for you, uh, which means kind of, in a sense, open the Torah for you, and then you will see what, randomly, what page from the, usually from the, Parashat part, parashit part, the Genesis, and they kind of like scroll real fast, and then boom, stop on one page. And then if you have the specific page with this verse, it might mean this or it might mean that. So, so this is what I want to do here. But let's stop. I'm not gonna look. Let's see. Um, let's go from here. And Elohim spoke to Nah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons, and your sons' wives with you, <coughs> and all the animals that are with you. Um, by the way, so you see here, Israelites, Samaritan, Dexed, Jewish, and Zoretics, if you're interested to see the differences. Uh, I think the ones that are in bold are kind of like different. Here it says, for example, and all. So, one thing you might find in the Samaritan, but do we have and I think more than the Masoretic text. Correct me if I'm wrong here. So, oh, I'm not sharing, am I? There we go. Talking about this one. And Elohim spoke to Nas saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons, again, so, and all the animals. So here it says, All living things that is with thee of all flesh, both fowl and cattle. <coughs> all right, let's go for another one. And see other highlighted words. 
in differences. <coughs> you know what? I want to go to the first one. Yeah, Larry, it's it's it, it's special for sure. I want to go for the f uh, first few sentences here. So, um, all right, this is commentary until we get to the to uh, both. There we go. Let's see changes until here. I don't see any first page until we have fruit tree. We have and the fruit tree in the Samaritan one. So Israel Israelite Samaritan text. Again, has usually the word and more. Tell me if you guys know about that one. And Elohim created the big crocodiles. Here it says whales. In ancient Hebrew, we say "taninim agadalim." Taninim usually means whales. Uh, sorry, crocodiles. Apparently, in the Jewish one, it means whales. Another difference, and according to our form after our likeness wow interesting in ancient hebrew we say um oh and even before that sorry the the, uh, the more accurate one for the according to our form <coughs> right which means according to our form. So this is one of my favorite verses in the Torah, that God created man in his own image. And you can so you can really talk a lot about like a lot of things concerning this verse. The living of every have every living thing. That's one difference. One most important difference, uh, difference known is sixth and seventh. And in the sixth day, Elohim completed his work. And here it says, on the seventh day, Elohim com com uh, finished his work. That I know. Heavens and earth, heavens, earth and heavens. That's You see, like in the Samaritan one, it has heavens first and then earth. So these differences, if you ask some people, they will tell you it's, it's like the, a, a portion of it. Again, not saying who changed, but some people say that a portion of it was changed either by mistake, deliberate mistake. Uh, undeliberate mistake and some deliberate mistakes so you know that's uh, I think a topic for later but but still we say some we see some things here all right let's go a little bit further in the half here Aaron a Canaanite was just based on people who lived in the land of Canaan there was no genetic profile replacement for the people of the land from middle bronze age to late or in age one right that's why Samaritans have uh, usually when they do some DNA tests they have like a really high percentage of uh, Canaanite like mostly you get Samaritan commentary on the verses, I think um, we definitely have. Larry, you have to see this book I, I, I use to uh, to read in the parasha of the week. It's, uh, first of all, it's a beautiful book. It's handwritten, but I think the one I have is the copy from the handwritten. So, But anyways, this person has beautiful commentary on uh, the verses. And wow, it's really mind-blowing. Um, like things that I actually like never knew like never thought even about asking and it makes so much sense what he's saying I'll, I'll definitely do an episode on that and like give you a, a video of what I'm talking about that'll be really interesting Here it says, they shall eat them by which atonement was made with them to be ordained. And they shall eat them by which atonement was with them to consecrate them. So to be ordained by them is a word that we don't see in this Jewish text. <coughs> day by day, continuously, a continuous offering. It's a beautiful verse. Um... 
I mean, this is something that we read in Shabbat day by day, continuously, a continuous uttering. Which in ancient Hebrew we say, like the word uh, lulam, which means forever or continuous, lulam, uh, for uh, many, many generations to come. So. Here it says, they shall wash their hands, and they will wash their hands, and their feet, that they die not, that they will not die. So this is one verse. This is the verse we read when we actually wash our hands before we go to prayer. So we wash our hands, our feet, our face. So this is the verse that we read. And Shema spoke to Moshe, saying, and take also for yourself the finest of spices, Flowering with 500 and shekels and fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 200 things for basically uh, all those things for the incense in the altar. All right, it says here, and Shema spoke to Moshe, and then it says, and Adonai said unto Moses, Shema, if you if you don't know Shema, it's basically how we pronounce the name of God. YHWH for us is pronounced as Shema. Interestingly, here that they translated it as Shema. Because I didn't see that the author is, uh, of, the, of this book is actually a uh, Samaritan. Um, from Misrim, with great power and with a mighty arm here it says from the land of egypt with great power and with strong hand see that's also one difference pretty fascinating you know i'm not trying like remember we're not trying to see uh prove or any, like you know uh, mis misprove any anyone here it's i think the the differences here you know they make you ask questions of why were they mistakes um and like how could you do a mistake like that, right? Because I think uh, one explanation of once some people would say is that the mistake is because there was not many books around, right, at that time. But still, this is the Torah. It's like used to be the huge center of the uh, the Israelites' uh, religion, right? So, <coughs> all right. I think that's it for today. Again, if it feels like I'm reading and only reading and barely commenting, uh, please don't see it as like just reading. <laughs> uh, for me, it's an opportunity really to, you know, just study with you guys and and also ask you questions and you asking me questions. And it also makes me just, I think, just remember this information better. And it's I think it's many of you will find some of what I read interesting here because um, you know, it's a big world out there. There's so much information, and I personally, I as you can see, there's a few words. I mean, there's many words that I came across that uh, you know, that it's the first time I ever see them. So when you have, when you discover a new word, it kind of opens up. Also, if when you when you discover a new word, it opens up a new world, really, uh, for you because you know you can get. You know, one word can save you a lot of, uh, obviously, a lot of explanation. If I had to tell you what is that word again, what is that word I asked about? Uh, con, consonant, consonantal, right? Well, now um, I can just know what is a consonantal means, but, you know, you don't have to tell me all this paragraph. So, so th I, that's why I like this uh you know this uh process that i'm like reading and just reading with you guys and also searching and um you know imagine a thousand lives lives from now lives being not chaim, like not life life but lives like a live stream imagine a thousand live streams from now how much information we can get and learn and you know and in the end be creative about it Cre creativity is really you know bringing connections together and in a smart way out of seemingly no connections between the two, you will find those connections. Um, so thank you guys for uh, sticking. If you're uh, if you're still here, uh, do leave a like and uh, leave a share, and hopefully see you in the next time. And also uh, wishing you a blessed Shabbat. My uh, 
you know, recently Shabbat has been a huge cure for me in terms of um, I, I've been noticing that I do have tendencies to check, check the phone much more these days. You feel like you're missing out or something. Shabbat, you just when you enter Shabbat, boom, that's like zero, literally 